Hi everyone, I'm Justin. Oh, that's a bit loud. And I lead our population health data intelligence work for Cerner in the non-US market. Uh, I'm a medical doctor by background and I've also had roles on the National Information Board trying to work out things like target architectures of how all the IT is going to work top to bottom and very happy to pick that up in breaks and discuss it as we start getting into micro platforms and things like that. Uh, but today I really want to focus a lot on the technology aspects that, to enable the population health journey uh, and try and give some examples as I go. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I think there's been quite a good debate already about what is population health. I think from my perspective it feels like a book we'll write one day, but we're still on chapter one of really trying to work out what this really, really means for us. And we're all trying to grapple with the early care models, interventions and technologies that are going to help support that. There is no definition of population health management. If you stick it in Google, just like that, you'll get like five and a half million returns. Um, so I cobbled this together just from different things because I think there were some key aspects in it. Uh, the first one is about taking some sort of responsibility or accountability for a whole population, just like that 1.7 mentioned at the beginning. But already around the world, uh, that already starts to deviate because in the US market, what they mainly mean by accountable care organisations is an attributed list of citizens that are under an insurance plan where you're optimising their health outcomes. Not everywhere, but, but mainly. Here it's very place-based, as we know, and we worry about unmet need in every single citizen within a geography. A lot of the Nordic countries very much the same, but some of them have integrated health and social care systems. Finland's moving now to legislation they're voting on this um, summer to set up uh, 17 regions that are accountable care organisations. They will devolve the budget to them, like our devolution here, and uh, they'll have the responsibility for the budget locally. And they're trying to think about, also well, how do we enable that? So it's a little bit different in different places. I think pretty much every country I am working, certainly on the developed, na developed nation side of it, is focusing on the quadruple or triple aim, as already mentioned. Uh, and I think we've already talked very much about this last point, which is really key. And I'm trying to give some examples today about some of the experience we found with some clients already in this space, that it is about the holistic opportunity to bring all of our assets in health, social care, civic, voluntary sector and everything together because we're really trying to hit those wider determinants that have already been discussed. And so there's something in, in these bits here. Now, from a strategic point of view, what we find with clients that are doing quite well on this journey and our strategy and how we work with clients, we're working with about 135 um, uh, integrated care systems, is uh, just quite simple, actually. It's just no engage manage. Uh, and I think it's quite also profound because there's a lot of people I've found in places that get quite stuck about population health from a technology point of view being population health analytics. And that's certainly very helpful because it's going to help you segment, micro-segment and find out where your problems and challenges are. But of course, if you don't do something about it, then they won't get better. So the opportunity, of course, is to engage citizens, their care uh, providers, the health and social care system and others to engage, to take action, to actually bring the insights to deliver actionable change and manage to the outcomes that you've all decided are important. Uh, and I think uh, that opportunity to improve the health of a population but do it one person at a time, both are equally important. And I think a lot of the clients that are very successful aren't trying to do everything for everybody all of the time. Uh, they're trying to create a standard level of care, but they're actually focusing on micro-segments that they might have most impact in. So quite a nice little example. We had Geisinger over here uh, last, uh, earlier in the year talking about the work they've done, because they've done this for about 20 years, uh, this, this type of technique. And they've got so refined in their uh, cycles of how they go through this that they were giving this example around diabetes because they've sorted diabetes out in their care models for some time. But yet still they found this little micro segment of just 175 patients that despite their care models still had a haemoglobin A1C of nine and a half and weren't being controlled. So they went to find out why that was the case and they mapped social deprivation, nutrition and all these other pieces of information and they just found that this group was malnourished and deprived. So their engaged strategy for that was to bring them in, but bring them in with their family members because if they're malnourished then their family members will be malnourished. Uh, teach them how to source and cook nutritious food and sustain behaviours and that was their engagement programme and they managed the outcome so they got it down to about seven and a half for that group of patients. So for me, in a way, this kind of encapsulates a lot of the opportunity with population health and that broader uh, opportunity because it's using marketing techniques just as much to try and segment. And all of a sudden, things like risk stratification have got a lot more interesting uh, because of our ability to layer all sorts of data to try and 
uncover those small niche opportunities that we need to work on. Uh, and what we found is we have to sort out really quite a lot of data to be able to do this, uh, to drive those insights and take action. Uh, and as you'll see, the health and social care electronic information systems is really just kind of one bubble. Uh, a lot of clients are working down the pyramid that's described already on things like primary prevention and could be running uh, influenza immunization campaigns where they may be delivered by retail pharmacies. Um, claims and payer data tells a lot in different countries when they, a lot of care is provided in different parts of the sector. The citizens capturing their own device data increasingly uh, and the open data, this social deprivation and other determinants that we've been discussing this morning. Um, so you have to sort out quite a lot of data and we've had to, we've done that for 660 data sources now. Um, but for a lot of the, um, for a lot of the health and the, the wellness data, what we're finding is to sort it out, we have to do this double process uh, of standardization and normalization. And what we mean by that is that uh, about 60% of data that we receive actually comes in proprietary formats, a little bit technical. So we have to uh, convert the proprietary code formats into standard code formats. So uh, for any terminologists here, if it's a clinical term, we want it to be on SNOMED, if it's a lab on LOINC and those sorts of decisions, uh, and including, including on, the, on the social side as well. Uh, but then once we get to a set of standard terms, we need to normalise it to the concepts that are important for what we're trying to manage together at a population level. Because for the population programme, we really want to know whether the influenza vaccine has been administered. But some of the systems might have captured that there was a vaccine code. Another might have captured that the, the procedure of doing it was captured. And if you take something like diabetes, it could be any combination of diagnostic codes, um, citizens on insulin, doctors tracking a hemoglobin A1C, patients doing lots of glucose measures. There's lots of terms that could mean that a concept is true. And clients are trying to sort this spaghetti out because they don't want to spend time keep going back to the data. They really want to work at this level um, to uh, innovate their care programs. So taking as much data as possible, taking it through standardization, normalization processes, um, and uh, getting to a single source of truth is a data intelligence record because you guys are doing a really great job, I know, with a lot of the information exchange work uh, with structured and unstructured information and getting it at the point of care. Uh, we find for the population health we have to do that one step further and take it through further processes to get it to that data intelligence version so that we can then start building the learning system and everything that needs to go around that. So uh, from this, we can actually automatically identify citizens into the cohorts you've decided to track and manage against. You may have found from your analysis that the problem isn't diabetes. Half the variation is due to 15% of diabetics that have a mental health or uh, uh, deprivation. So you might want to focus on that. Uh, and your ability, like a clinical trial, to write a rule that's an inclusion and exclusion criteria can automatically assign citizens into cohorts. As you design, design new care models, we use a lot of work with clients on attribution because you decide actually who are the members of your new integrated care team that actually are responsible for certain sub-segments and how you want to work. So the ability to automatically attribute is helpful and then track and manage against outcomes. And a lot of what we're trying to do uh, here is turn things like care plans into intelligent care plans. Uh, I kind of like in Sweden, they always describe the citizen in the ring of caregivers, not in the middle. Uh, and the profound point they're making there is that the citizen has a set of activities they're responsible for. The GP has a set of responsibilities. The hospital has a set of... Everyone has a set of responsibilities. And we think the future of this is actually an intelligent version where we know all the activities that are going on. We can use predictive rules to find out, oh, you're at risk of stroke, so you might want to do stroke behaviour change and bring that together in a, in a much more fluid, orchestrated way. So we don't have people, new roles like care managers, chasing down patients to see have you done this or haven't you done that? We know that, the data's already there. They need to focus on the, uh, are they activated? Are they making a change to the behavior in the way that John was describing? The other important thing we found is actually getting this information then back into the citizen and the care provider's own environments. Um, so Advocate in Chicago, this was their fourth generation IT system. They started with an access database and phone calls out to everybody to see whether things were happening. Um, but the trouble with their third generation, where they had a citizen-centric view, uh, was it took them two and a half months every quarter to do this process, so they could only sit down with their integrated care system and look at whether they were doing well or not four times a year, but they're now managing 800,000 citizens on at-risk contracts 
out of the one and a half million. It is their core, their core business is now value-based healthcare. Uh, but by doing this, they could do this in near real time and they got their outcomes delivered two months ahead of schedule uh, in the first year they did this. Um, and I'll show you that later. So this is kind of what the data intelligence version looks like is because it's not just then a, a whole... So if you click on aspirin, there might be 62 entries because they've come in all different formats. We can get it down to pure concepts. But the advantage then, if you're running a, 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 you know, a rule against it, you can say, well, we want all post-myocardial infarct patients to be on low-dose aspirin. You can measure it because the concepts are there. They're pure. You don't have to keep going back saying... Well, how does it get captured in the GP system, the hospital system, uh, the citizens app, and so on? So quite often clients are getting started here with Know Your Population. Uh, it's been interesting for me starting here in the non-US market because we have quite a lot of transparency of information. We've had fingertips and public health profiles. We, a lot of patches know where their big challenges are. They may not know inside of that until you bring all the data together where to focus inside of it. Um, so here's some examples. So Children's Hospital Orange County are responsible, accountable for total budget, total quality of about 230,000 uh, kiddies. Uh, the problem they've got around the Los Angeles area is one of pollution. Uh, and that means a lot of their kids are coming in with asthma. Um, and they've been able to map pollution data to their health data and their gaps in care to know where they should be diverting their assets, like their Breckmanville vans. Uh, now what they're doing is they're working with the school nurses in schools, knowing there's going to be a problem, giving them smart peak flow meters so they can now be proactive in their intervention in the school environment, not just wait for them to turn up into the emergency department. I'll show you some of their outcomes in a second. Truman Medical Center is a safety net hospital, uh, so it's run like a charity on a knife's edge financially. Uh, but what they found was uh, when they did the analysis on the data, this is their mapping to social deprivation, uh, they found that there's 40,000 uh, citizens that keep coming in every year to the hospital and they were homeless, they didn't have a GP, they had no access because it's an inner city area to fresh fruit or vegetables and now they're running uh, new types of services where they're actually getting fresh food vans into these deprived locations and trying to work upstream because it might be more cost effective than just waiting for them to turn up every year into the hospital and managing them uh, without reimbursement. Memorial Herman um, might have been mentioned a bit, they're kind of leaders in accountable care and they've got so good at it and they're one of the top performers for the programs in the US that a lot of their analytics are now looking at network leakage as they call it because when they're accountable for uh, the cost and quality, when they see that patients go outside of their care models and their integrated system, the outcomes are worse and they use that to have conversations with their teams, say well how, how do we better manage uh, patient. So this is a, a view from some of the work we've been doing in the Wirral Peninsula. I'll go through their story just in a little bit here. Um, this is just showing where the gaps in care are for COPD mapped against uh, uh, deprivation in housing environments because they're trying to work out where they're going to locate their new care models uh, for respiratory disease and other things. So this is where I think the risk stratification and cohort identification gets very interesting because you're starting to be able to mash together different types of information um, to be able to then pinpoint where we're going, going to focus those activities. Quite often then we find with clients that they want to go and then ma actively manage uh, cohorts. Um, so uh, these, this is a registries tool that actually uh, automatically populates uh, citizens into registries and the system will define what good looks like. And I'll give some examples later. Uh, the work in the Wirral used NICE uh, standards where it made sense, QOF uh, where it made sense. They worked with the Aqua group and they, as an integrated system, decided what does good look like? What are we trying to achieve um, for these cohorts? Uh, and if you're actually contractually managing also, then a uh, reflection of that about what are the things we need to do contractually for our value-based contracts. But what that comes down to is that uh, you'll get a list of gaps in care um, that can actually be accessed. So if I'm a GP in a GP system, like this, uh, this is a hospital system, that's the EMIS GP system, we can put the gaps in care because of the attribution back into the information systems. And that's helpful then because as a doctor, I can see what, do I, what am I meant to be doing for the patient in the context of how we're collectively managing them at a population level. Or if I'm a GP, I can see... The, the same there. So everybody starts then working on the same outcomes they've all agreed to. Um, but also this one's a citizen example uh, where the clients put the gaps in care into the citizens environment with the tools that they can engage with as well because they are contributing to this as their care plan and the things that they're trying to achieve as well. So uh, their opportunity to try and improve activation of the citizen to take a role, active role. So this is the Children's Hospital Orange County and when they started they were finding, finding they were getting about 20% um, documented asthma care plans and documented asthma control tests 
uh, which is nowhere near where they wanted it to be. They ran these sort of tools like registries to find gaps in care, and then they've driven up interventions to resolve those gaps in care. And sometimes that can be quite intelligently orchestrated. So if a kiddie does come into the emergency department with asthma, because that does happen, there might be new, a new diagnosis, a rule will fire based on the population understanding that will put it on a work list of a care manager to get a care plan in place before they're discharged. So they're using iterative techniques to drive up that conformance and over the same time period have managed to reduce by half their emergency department uh, admissions. Uh, as well as length of stay and other things they've been achieving. Uh, one of the key principles we found with this is the need to be an open platform because you, you hear a lot about AI and predictive algorithms and that's going to be a whole ecosystem of people inventing intelligence and you guys will do some and your academic partners here will be doing some as well. Uh, so we're working with Bradford on their frailty index to put that in the platform. We have to be open to embedding intelligence from everywhere. So we're working with a lot of the AI companies to embed in here. And the good thing is they don't want to normalize data and it will speed them up. But making sure that applications come with open APIs because your app uh, system doesn't want to normalize data and things. Oh, one minute. Oh, my goodness. Um, so you know, the ability to integrate citizens is important. I use this as an example because they've just put in a test bed application. And I quite like it because we can run an HRL fibrillation registry and we can predict the patients that are likely to have atrial fibrillation that aren't diagnosed, they can run the stroke behaviour change and actually if you join the two together then it's additive and the citizens and the citizen are working together. I won't do the predictive models, we've made a start here, I'll talk about that if you want to in the break. So we're all very quickly in one minute. Uh, so the Wirral Peninsula has a 10 year life discrepancy across uh, this patch of land. They have rich footballers living here, in fact John Deavings in the audience can tell you more uh, and they have a shipbuilding industry that was falling out around Liverpool with lots of deprivation, unemployment, but huge issues and inequalities to address. And the demand's going up as before. So the traditional care models just can't cope with that. They have done that basic stratification that John was talking about. And they're looking at what interventions like the registries against the rising risk and wellness programs here to better address it. They're spending time looking at how does their interactions for things like diabetes work in the system now and engaging the public to say, how do you want to experience it? And then designing what it should look like so that they can then uh, build better uh, care models. So we're having to sort out all of this data. We've done half of that. And they've had a really good engagement with the public with an opt-out rate of less than one. I think it's about 0.25%. Uh, and they're focusing a lot of their first cohorts they're actively managing because they have six times the rates of ED admission. But they're very rapidly getting on now in design phase for these much more complicated topics like frailty, end of life, and so on. Because that's really where we need to get to, these complex comorbid situations. And just to hit last slide, this is just some of the early data showing actually when they've decided what outcomes are important for their population, uh, so most QOF scores I guess are around 97, 98%. What's interesting is for these cohorts they're actually achieving sort of 20 to 40 or 40 to 60%. So there's some way to go on the unmet need for what they think is the best practice. And here you can see the correlations to the ED encounters. So they're able to then start iterating to say, well, where are we putting our care models? Where's the attention needed most? Look at the spread of opportunity that they've got there to resolve. So I'll just end actually where a lot of people are talking about today, which is great, which is it's, it's, it's both managing populations and the ability to do it one per person at a time. And I think that's the exciting thing. For me, it feels like it's public health meeting that sort of digital ability to impact individual people. Uh, and I think that's the exciting opportunity for population health management. Thank you. <laughs>